in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from the east from Eden, where there was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Uh, ar aromatic, you'll have to excuse my glasses, I just start working. <laughs> aromatic rosins and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gion. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you do eat from that, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had found out, had formed out, out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all of the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed the wound Close the flesh, close the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked. They felt no shame. Children, will you please come forward? Gentlemen, how are you? start to school. What grade again? <coughs> Second grade. Sixth grade. Oh my gosh. You guys are growing up. Getting to be responsible young men. So uh, so we heard that story from Genesis chapter 2. And it's an important story um, that tells us a little bit about what God has in mind when he creates people like you and me. What is, what's, what's his purpose? Why does he create people in the first place? That's what that story is telling us about. And in the story, it says that God made a garden, and he put um, the man and the woman who he creates um, in the garden. And what does he tell them to do? Do you remember what you heard there? What are they supposed to do in the garden? Have you ever seen a farm? How does, that, how does the food grow on a farm, and how do the, the animals grow? Feed them, fertilize. There's a lot of work that goes into a farm, isn't there? So the garden is a place um, that isn't just going to grow and be a good place to live just by letting it go. God says to humankind, he says to human beings, I'm placing you in the garden to take care of it. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to watch over it and take care of it. You're going to have to, to um, take care of the plants and cultivate them and fertilize them. And the word, one of the words that we use to describe what that work is, is the word steward. Have you ever heard that word before? Steward. It's kind of a funny word, isn't it? So you are a steward, and you're a steward, and I'm a steward. A steward is somebody who is given a responsibility for something. So it's like this. I pulled this out of my wallet, $10 bill, 
And um, I could say this $10 is mine, and that's true. Um, actually, this $10 bill came from my wife, so it really hurt. <laughs> um, but maybe that makes my point. So my wife gave me this, um, and I am stewarding it. I am taking care of it. So she didn't give me this $10 bill to just kind of spend willy-nilly on junk. But she trusts that I'm going to be responsible with this. And God says the same thing. He says, um, one of the things that I give you is money, and I want you to take care of it. Um, here's some other things that God gave me to take care of, to be a steward of. So you recognize uh, that young family there? Yeah, that's me and um, a few years ago. Those are our kids. I don't know if you've ever met our kids. You might have met our, our son. He's way bigger than that now. <clears throat> God gives us families to take care of. So I, I, along with my wife Tammy, we are stewards of our family. We take care of our family. And that's what God wants us to do. So that's what it means to be a steward. Um, I have, have you, you've been in my office, right? And on my shelves are what? lots of books. This is one of the things that I am given to steward our books and words. God says to me as a pastor, Tom, I, I want you to take care of words. Be careful with them and, and take care of them so that they um, serve the cause of my kingdom. So they serve me. So I'm a steward of words. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty good with my hands. And a lot of people are good with their hands, and they use tools to make things. And, and in that way, they are stewards. They take care of things by building and making. You know, our musicians and singers, they're stewards of their voices and their instruments. You are stewards of your education. God says, um, I'm putting you in a school, and I want you to take care of your education, your learning. That's an important responsibility to God, to take care of that. So, so when we read that story in Genesis, we're reading about being stewards, being a caretaker. God puts us in those places uh, in life to, to be able to take care of them. Okay, And let's pray. And we're going to pray that God will give you wisdom to be good caretakers of your education and your families and your friends and maybe your sports, your athletic abilities. Lots of different things that God says, I want you to take care of these things because I'm giving them to you to be responsible with. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have um, trusted us with the care of all of the things you've given us. Um, abilities and resources, education, athletics and sports and games, friendships. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us, um, help us to be faithful um, in the ways that we take care of what you've given us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats or, because I think you're both, well, I don't know if you're going down to, if you're going down with Darren, you can head on down with him. Okay. Our second scripture lesson is taken from Luke's Gospel. In many ways, this is a, a parable being told by Jesus that picks up on this uh, theme of stewardship, of being caretakers, of being entrusted uh, by the Lord with uh, this good creation. So we begin here in, uh, in chapter 19. We're coming at this point in Luke's gospel, we're coming to the end of Jesus' uh, ministry. Uh, things are coming to a head and he's on his way to Jerusalem. That's crucial for understanding the parable. Um, so the parable that, he, that we're about to read, that Jesus tells, is told specifically in that context of he, he has just finished at Zacchaeus' house. 
uh, this person who was not a very good caretaker as a tax collector. But when he comes in contact um, with this person, Jesus, he's, um, he completely has a, has a complete change of, uh, of mindset. Um, his, what he seeks and what he sees is completely transformed when he encounters Jesus. And then after, uh, after this uh, story of Zacchaeus, um, you have uh, this as, uh, as Jesus is nearing Jerusalem. While they were listening to this, that is his comment um, to Zacchaeus, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near, because, for this reason, because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So he said this, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. And so he called ten of his servants and he gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and he returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been a, trust, a trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. And the second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I was a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take this mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Lord God, we ask that you would give us uh, wisdom, that you would send your spirit, that we would see uh, uh, differently here this morning, and that we would um, seek um, what is of you. Um, change us, Lord, that our hearts might seek after your kingdom in its fullness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're beginning a, uh, uh, a series here. Um, we're going to be looking for the next, uh, it's going to be four weeks. We're going to take a little break uh, at the end of September. We're going to hear from the folks who did the uh, week of mission. Uh, in order to, uh, to share um, and hear a little bit about that Mission Week experience. But um, into October, we're going to be thinking about why money matters. We're going to be thinking about um, our wealth. Um, and why is that important? Why is it important in the first place for um, believers, for churches, for followers of Jesus to be concerned about um, what what many um, in our culture would say is a private matter. Um, your, your wealth is a private matter. We don't talk about those kinds of things publicly. We don't share those kinds of things because, um, because what, you've, what you have earned with your hard work is yours and it's your, uh, it, that's your prerogative to do with it what you want. So why does money matter? Why bother? Why take this kind of time? You know, you know so I grew up, um, growing up, in, uh, going to church. Um, I heard it often um, in, um, in the circles that I grew up in. I've heard it uh, as a pastor, as a college chaplain. 
the number of times that people have said to me, I, I just don't like going to church because all they do is talk about money. Or all they're doing is asking for, they're, they're just, you know, it's just a pastor up there, money grubber, you know, waiting with his hands out and waiting for you to give. Why is it important um, for us to talk about this? And, and we talk about it um, particularly at this time of year because this is the time of the year when we, as the family of God here at Mount Pisgah, are preparing um, for the next year. We're budgeting. Um, we're thinking about what's important for our ministry and life together and service and mission to this community. And in order to do that, we have to think carefully about um, being faithful stewards with what we have with regard to our building, our gifts, our talents, and our resources um, money-wise. Money matters. And, and we're going to be taking a few weeks to think about why and to think about it from a biblical um, perspective. We want to dig into Scripture. We want to listen to God's words, just like we sang at that opening time. Um, we want to make ourselves available to hearing God's words and hearing them afresh that we might be moved to faithfulness and obedience and know the grace of God in the midst of it all. So this first week we're going to be thinking about stewardship and wealth in, in, in general terms. This word um, stewardship is an important part of who we are as followers of Jesus. And so we go back to the garden. We go back, uh, as I said with the, uh, the young men here, um, that story is a story that sets God's agenda for us, um, for all humankind, into the future. Um, that story is important because um, it tells us, it gives us a, a window into God's heart and desire in creating in the first place. He creates humankind, places them in a garden for a purpose, not just for humankind's enjoyment. He certainly intends for us as human beings, as those who've been created in his image, to enjoy the creation. But he has a job for us, he has a task for us, he has expectations for us. And the word that we use most frequently to describe his expectations is the, is the word steward, a caretaker. Um, that, that the Lord doesn't say, um, I provided this garden and it can run on autopilot. It can take care of itself. All you have to do is pick its fruit. No. He places um, humankind in the garden and gives them responsibility to care for that, to, to create from that garden on um, all that we have today. And the expectation you know, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, um, is, is the marker of how it's going to happen. It's going to happen. To be a caretaker um, is to know that it has to be done in accordance with the Lord's will. Will we be faithful to the Lord's word as we care for what he has given us? That's the key. A good steward is a steward who says, um, I'm not going to do with... With what I have been entrusted, I'm not going to do with it um, according to my own design and desire and will. I am setting aside my self-interest and, and taking on the interest of my master, of the one who has entrusted me with this. That's what a steward does. A good steward says, um, this is not mine, it is my master's, and I want to use it, I want to develop it, I want to care for it in accordance with his word and his will. Now, when we go back to the garden, you know, we, we talked about the, that song Woodstock, Joni Mitchell, you know, where they, they sing, um, that, that Woodstock generation sings about back to the garden because it's a simpler life. So when I say, let's get back to the garden, I'm not saying because some, somehow it was simpler then. There is nothing simpler about the life that Adam and Eve have in the garden in terms of dealing with the hard um, questions of life. How do we do this faithfully? It's simply to say that as we go back to the garden, we find um, the, the starting point for answering this question, why does money matter? Money is part, money is one piece of that good creation 
that God says, I want you to care for this. I want you to steward it. I want this um, part of the creation to be used in accordance with my will and my desire, my design. And so when we, um, when we get to scripture and we begin to ask this question uh, about wealth, and money and why it matters. Um, one of the things that we ha we have got to do is we've got to recognize our inclination, our tendency to read scripture through the lens of our current historical cultural context, and namely um, a, a cultural context that is um, that is characterized by capitalism and materialism. Okay. Um, and so we end up oftentimes when we go to scripture with these, uh, with a desire to understand why money matters to God, we tend to ask the wrong questions. You know, so oftentimes people will debate, well, was Jesus really a capitalist or a Marxist? And it's the wrong question. Jesus had no interest in an argument um, about capitalism and Marxism. That He had no... Uh, that was inconceivable to him. He is living and telling stories in a wholly different context. And this, this parable that we um, are dealing with today is one that has been um, historically been used um, in order to um, make a case for um, Jesus' support of capitalism. Jesus doesn't support capitalism one way or another. And we'll talk about this a little in, in just a sec. But, but we have, we've got to, if we're going to hear Jesus' words, if we're, going to, if we're going to allow the Spirit to speak, we have to be willing to step out of our cultural context and be able to think carefully about what Jesus is saying to his disciples in the first century. Um, the invisible hand up there, you probably can't read that. That comes from, uh, from Adam Smith. So if we want to think about capitalism... Um, here, is, here is one of the primary tenets of capitalism. By pursuing my own interest, one frequently um, uh, um, uh, pursues the, the benefits of society indirectly. This is, the, this is what lays at the heart of capitalism. That in my pursuit of self-interest, sometimes I might even help out society as kind of a byproduct. And so even to think in, in those basic terms that this is the basic, um, this is a basic tenet of capitalism, um, we have to listen carefully now to Jesus' words in this parable. And the question we've got to ask ourselves is, um, is there, in the telling of the parable, is there any room for self-interest? For self-interest. Is, is that what lays behind Jesus' telling of the story? In the story that we have, in the story that Jesus tells, each person is unique. We aren't really... Um, the, the people aren't really distinguished until when the master, uh, until the time of the master's return. Um, each person is unique, with the expectations being the same. Each person is gifted, um, and and um, and what's different about uh, what's the same about um, each person, even though each is different in terms of personality and gifting is um, the fact that the expectations the master has remain the same for each one. Those expectations are the expectations of faithfulness. The question that is raised by the master upon his return is what? Not have you been successful. Not have you been successful. But have you been faithful? Have you been faithful with what you've been given? Um, have, have you um, demonstrated 
your, in a public way, have you demonstrated your commitment to me as the master? Um, faithfulness to the Lord's will is what lays behind the giving. Um, here is uh, here's a more contemporary uh, uh, application of this um, parable. This is, this is an example of how this parable gets co-opted um, and torn out of context. And as such, the words of Jesus get twisted um, from what he intends them to be. This is Margaret Thatcher. You can't see in the pink there. Margaret Thatcher um, made this comment. Remember the parable of the talents in the New Testament. Christ exhorts us to be the best we can be by developing our skills and abilities, by succeeding in all our tasks and endeavors. What better description can there be of capitalism? Is that what Jesus is asking of his servants? You know, so, so it's, not that, um, it's not that Jesus doesn't want us to um, be the best that we can be. We, we can affirm that. Um, that Jesus wants us to succeed. But in the telling of this story, is that Jesus' focal point? Is that his purpose? Remember where the story begins. The story begins um, with Jesus... Um, let me go back there because I don't want to distract you yet. Um, when Jesus says, um, look, there are some who think um, that the kingdom is coming immediately. And he knows that, he, that, uh, that as he completes his work at the cross, um, as he returns to the Father in heaven, there's going to be a time that even he cannot predict between his uh, accomplishing his purpose on earth and his return to make all things new. And in the meantime, what does he expect of his servants. And so he tells the story. The story has some interesting twists, doesn't it? Um, we often um, just kind of gloss over or kind of pass over this, the introduction to the story that there is a delegation sent after the king who does not want him to be king. That's crucial to the story. It's crucial to recognize that what Jesus expects of his followers is a public display of faithfulness even though there are those who don't want him to be king. It matters what you do with what you have been given, says Jesus, and I'm going to be expecting upon my return to find you faithful publicly to demonstrate your willingness um, to, to be faithful to me, to obey me, even though there are those around you who don't want me to be Lord. And isn't that the case in our lives? Isn't that the case in our historical, cultural context? That there are those who um, do not want Jesus to be Lord, to be proclaimed Lord over all. And the challenge of being a disciple is precisely that, to be faithful to Jesus, to say Jesus is my Lord and, and he is the one who owns and determines what I do with everything that I have, including my monetary wealth. How radical it is for Christians to say, my money, my um, bank account, my savings, my IRA, um, my possessions are not really my own. I am a steward. How radically different from our culture those words are. And Jesus says, um, I expect when I return, I expect that, that if you say you're my disciple, that you will have shown that you were, you were faithful with what I gave you in this public fashion. You know, what, what is presumed in Jesus' storytelling, the, the people in the first century who are hearing Jesus tell this parable, when Jesus says, um, tells the story of those servants um, whose, um, whose mina, whose wealth um, produces more, that, that was, that's a public act, okay? Those servants wouldn't be able to accomplish those things 
um, in a private way. It is only the one who wraps his mina up in a rag, is a more literal translation, and hides it away. He is the one who wants to keep it private that I'm connected with this master. I'm afraid of what these people around me might think if I make public my relationship to the master by virtue of how I treat my wealth, what I have been entrusted with. Jesus expects um, a demonstration of faithfulness in a powerful way. It's interesting um, as well as we come towards the end of the story that uh, that the story doesn't have a real ending. You know, the master speaks some harsh words about those who didn't want him to be king, right? And what they deserve. But we don't have in the story a description of that judgment being carried out. The story is by Jesus is left intentionally open-ended. In fact, we don't even have in the story that Jesus tells a clear indication of what happens with that servant who is afraid and, and wraps his mind in a rag and puts it in his pocket in the, in the mask. We don't even have a, a conclusion to where that person is in the end of all things. There's an openness to the story. There's a welcoming of Jesus in the telling of the story for us, as well as his hearers back then, to say, who am I? Where do I fit in the story? And even if I have um, in my life been one of those ones who said, I don't want this one to be my king. I don't want this Jesus for my Lord. That even if that's me, the story is left open-ended for a change of heart, for grace and for mercy. Money matters because the Lord has entrusted us with this good creation and money, um, our wealth, is one aspect, one aspect of that good creation that the Lord says, um, I, I expect of you faithful obedience. That is the storyline from Genesis all the way up through the end. Here is how uh, Ken Bailey, um, and this is his numbering from his uh, book, uh, Ken Bailey, uh, and so, I don't know if folks know, uh, Ken Bailey passed away um, almost a year ago now. Uh, this incredible New Testament scholar, uh, some of us have watched some of his videos. But he has uh, in-depth commentary on, on this along with other parables from Luke. And he has some helpful suggestions about about what we ought to attend to as we listen to this parable. He says this parable is about um, the, the servants of Jesus being given resources for, for, for fulfilling the master's commands. Their gifts for which the servants are accountable to the master. What we have been given, time, talent, energy, homes, possessions, church building, musical gifts, intelligence, money. All of it is given, given to serve the master's commands. That's the heart of it. The master's primary expectation from his servants is courageous public faithfulness to an unseen master in an environment where some are actively opposed to his rule. The expectation is public um, courageous, faithful witness to the fact that we are disciples of Jesus. That's hard to do alone, but when we do it together, it's not so hard. And we do it um, trusting in the Lord's provision for us as we seek um, to provide that courageous public faithfulness. Humility is appropriate in his service. Note this, that the faithful servant tells the master, your pound has produced, okay? Um, he uses that passive um, voice in the verb. Your pound has produced, not I have made, I have earned, I have done, I, 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 I. It's our culture that says I, 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 mine, 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 like the seagulls, you know, in the, in the uh, what movie? 
What's that? Finding Nemo, right? Mine, 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 mine. That is the language of our culture. It's not the language of Jesus, of this parable, or of disciples. Yours, 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 yours. Yours, and by your power it has produced. And we simply are um, joyful to be participants, co-laborers, um, and trusted stewards of these gifts of yours. The reward for faithfulness is greater responsibilities. Note this, says um, Bailey, the, the servant whose pound produced ten was not given a generous pension, a paid vacation, or a villa on the sea. He was given more responsibility. He was given more responsibility. The end goal of our wealth is not um, our retirement and riding off into the sunset. Um, the goal the purpose that we have as disciples of Jesus is increased responsibility. Um, being entrusted with more with which to be faithful because we've been faithful with a little. This is what ought to motivate us, encourage us, shape us, um, form us in terms of our understanding um, of wealth and stewardship and why money matters to the Lord. back. So we're back to our ice cream sandwich, our Leonis. Um, our ice cream sandwich, that reminds us that um, there is at the beginning um, grace and at the end grace. Grace encompasses it all. Who are you in this story? Where do you find yourself in this parable? You know, this parable is not told by Jesus um, to beat people up, um, to make us feel guilty. Um, certainly my preaching um, for the next few weeks about why money matters is not to guilt you into giving money or to, um, um, to any course of action that does not flow out of your joyful desire to be faithfully obedient. But what I hope that you hear is that um, God, the master in the parable, gives these gifts as a gift. None of those servants deserved what he gave them in the first place. And none of them deserved the increased responsibility. And indeed, remember that the parable, the story is left open-ended. It could be that even these enemies, even these enemies might have change of heart. And as grace closes off the story, they receive grace too. This is the same Jesus who, who says to his disciples... Um, you love not just your friends, but your enemies, too. It begins with grace, and it ends with grace. It's a gracious invitation, Jesus says, um, to be stewards of all that you've been given. And that's everything. Everything that we have, every breath that we take, every thought that goes through our minds, every relationship with which we have... Um, um, have reason for joy. All that we have is given as gift from God to be stewarded, to be cared for in faithful obedience to the one who is the giver, to the one who is supremely gracious and merciful. May he find us as we respond to this parable. May he find us simply trusting and obeying. Let's pray again. Yeah.